Thanks a lot, Will. Um, so we got an idea of everyone's experience with Bitcoin. My question now is, since this is going to be slightly technical talk, we're talking about a software development kit here. I want to know how many of you out in the audience are, have done any type of programming, any type of development? Well, actually quite a few. Okay, very cool. So hopefully not all of the presentation goes over everybody's head. Um, great to know. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? So um, fundamentally, what we're really excited about is the fact that the Bitcoin and the blockchain have actually not just created a new paradigm in digital currency or just currency in general, but they've actually motivated a different type of security model. And a lot of companies in the space have been building security for Bitcoin, for blockchain, for private keys, and we're realizing that that actually applies to other data as well. And so our primary vision is, as Airbits, we say that we're trying to secure the future of blockchain technology. Um, and we've started with Bitcoin, but now we can apply it to other technologies as well. So what we have is what we call an edge security SDK. So edge security means that we secure data at the edges versus on centralized servers. So let's kind of take a look. Since this is a, a talk about security, let's talk, take a look at what we do today. So today, the model of security is very enterprise driven, meaning that we take valuable information and we stick it on central servers which have many weak points to compromise the data, many weak points of attack. You can attack the actual network that connects the end user to the servers, you can attack the servers themselves, you can attack the connections between servers, and really importantly, you can attack the people that manage the servers. So if you put stuff on Google Drive, you can kind of think that it's private, but a rogue employee that has access to those servers could compromise your data. And so, not only do we have to trust the technology, but we actually have to trust people as well and the storage providers. And so it's been pretty apparent that this model has failed us in many different ways. And even the largest, most well-established, and most well-funded companies can't seem to protect the data in a reliable way. Large companies like Home Depot, Chase, Apple, Microsoft, and obviously in the Bitcoin space, the exchanges, Bitfinex, have all in one way, shape, or form been hacked and compromised a significant amount of data. And so the challenge is that with centralized storage of data comes a huge amount of incentive. This incentive is incredibly, incredibly high to hack the system because once you get in, you potentially get all of the information and data and assets that you're looking for. So there's a huge amount of incentive to attackers. So what's a solution to this problem? Well, at Airbits, we fundamentally believe in the model of edge security. The concept being don't rely Definitely don't rely 100% on the server side security, but instead try to secure information and data on the device first, on the devices that are at the edges. So encrypt the data in such a way that only the end user who generated that data can access it. And then go and back it up and synchronize it. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the beauty of securing data at the edges first means that not only are you adding security by technology, like using technology to secure the data, but you're actually adding security by game theory because the incentive model now gets fully inverted. Now, for me to attack the system and to get all of the information, I have to potentially attack each device one by one by one by one. And the reward from attacking is only which devices I successfully get into. So that in essence is what we fundamentally believe can drive a much, much more improved security model than what we're doing today with the enterprise model. So one of the benefits as well from an edge security model is that if you think about it, all the devices that you own, for the most part, they only make outgoing connections. They go and ping a server, they go and ping another device on the network. They don't really take incoming connections. Servers, however, especially globally accessible internet servers, a website that's just out there, has to take incoming connections. And so you can liken this to a castle that you put all the gold in and you build really, really, really thick walls around this castle so that people can't get to the, the gold. But at the same time, you have to lower the drawbridge. And you gotta let some people in, but you don't wanna let the wrong people in. That's kind of what you have to do with a server side model. In contrast, once again, only out, most of the time, only outgoing connections from your devices, the devices at the edge. And like we had mentioned earlier, there's also the human element. When you put data, valuable assets on a central server, the bigger that that server gets, the more information that it holds for the more people, the more people you'll need to manage it. And the more people that you have managing that information, the higher the risk is now the more people you have to trust. So it doesn't scale very, very well. 
In contrast, the person you have to trust with access to edge devices are just those people, which sometimes is no more than one person. It's you, you own your phone, you own your laptop, maybe a family, maybe a small business, but definitely a much easier, scal a much easier scalability solution. So what's the problem? If this is such a great security solution, why haven't we been using it, especially for our own sensitive information? Well, the challenge is that putting security at the edges means that you have to give the people that control the edge devices the technology to secure their own data. And while we've had the technology available to us for 10, 20 years, it hasn't been easy to use and it hasn't been packaged up such that people could use it. So how many people here intentionally using a third-party tool actually encrypt their data? A couple people, probably the same people that said they're developers or had written some code in the past. And how many people intentionally back up their data? A few more people, awesome, we're getting better. How many people use revision control such that if the data is inadvertently edited, you can roll the data back? A handful, cool, we're improving. Now the, the challenge is getting all of that available to you and making it nearly seamless and invisible where you don't even have to know it's happening. For the most part, average user hasn't used many of these tools, some, not even any of them. And this is what effectively helps create the edge security platform. And that's where Airbits comes in. So we built a software development kit that allows developers to write data for their application that's automatically encrypted before it even touches the device, automatically backed up onto peer-to-peer -peer distributed servers, automatically synchronized between your different devices. So if you authenticate on your phone, then on your tablet, that data gets automatically synchronized between the two. It's automatically revision controlled, so that way if you inadvertently edit the data and you wanna go back a version, that you can do that and a unique solution as well for lost password recovery. And usually encrypted data solutions don't really give you a password recovery option, but we have one implemented and we have some cool new future options for that as well. And then we've implemented what we call one touch two factor and simply two, two factor authentication or device locking in a way that's nearly invisible to the user. So trying to take a lot of the technology that really improves security, especially at the edges and packaging it up, packaging it all up in an SDK for other developers to use. And so you guys came here because this is a, a Bitcoin meetup. And the Bitcoin uses, Bitcoin uses the blockchain. A lot of people are interested in the blockchain. Well, what we're excited about is that the blockchain itself is, or all blockchain applications have one common thing is that they need to edge secure private keys. The way you talk to a blockchain is through public and private keys. And so we're excited about the opportunity to work with many different blockchain companies and secure their private keys for them not really for them, but allow their users to secure their own private keys and effectively build kind of the single sign-on OAuth experience across blockchain applications. So instead of signing on with Facebook, signing on with Google, they can sign on with Airbits. And the big difference being that unlike sign on with Facebook and Google where you have to actually trust them 100% with your credentials, signing on with our platform doesn't require trust in us because it's all zero knowledge. Only the user has access to their data. So that's the unique thing about blockchain is it, it does have this need for kind of the zero knowledge, zero, almost zero trust um, edge security model. Some other future uses as well of edge security. So some of you are, are developers. How many people have heard of the, the Lightning Network? So just a few people. So this is a new technology coming down the pipe for fast, cheap, and very scalable transactions on either the Bitcoin blockchain or any other blockchain. A unique thing about the Lightning Network is that it actually requires wallets to save a small amount of data with every single transaction. With traditional Bitcoin wallets, how many, how many people here use uh, Mycelium or Bread Wallet? Cool, so there's a handful of people. You may have experienced when you use some of most Bitcoin wallets, they tell you to write down 12 words or 24 words, and that's your backup. And today that's true, that's all you need to recover your money if you lose your phone. In the future, with the Lightning Network, that's no longer true. The wallet actually needs to save some data, encrypt the data, and back it up for the user. As well, there's a, a really cool protocol called BIP47, which is payment codes, allowing you to have an anonymous payment address that you can receive money on, but without other people seeing how much money went to that address. And that also needs a little bit of data to be edge secured. And so, once again, you know, writing down 12 to 24 words is no longer good enough of a backup for some of this future technology. So we're excited to support that with securing actual data. 
So what does this look like? So there are a few developers out there. I won't spend too much time on code. But the main thing is you can basically edge secure data in about four lines of code. One line of code that says initialize the SDK with your API key. Another line says create an account. Throw in a username, a password, and a pin, and the account is created. And then another line that just says, okay, write a little bit of data. And you basically have a key value store database um, in the system. So you, you specify a kind of a folder name, a key, and then a value. And then that's it. That data is automatically encrypted, automatically backed up, and it's zero knowledge. Only the user has access to that information. And then just as easy to read back the data, this could be on a different device. You, if you've already initialized the SDK, you then log into the device with one command, password login, enter the username, enter the password. You then get an account object, and from there, you can do a data read from that account. And you specify the same folder, the same key, and that value gets spit out. So it's a very basic, simple key value store, except that it implements all of that added security underneath the covers that as a developer you don't have to deal with, and as a user you don't have to deal with. So since our roots at Airbits are heavily into Bitcoin, the platform also allows you to do Bitcoin transactions. So you can actually send and receive Bitcoin, uh, create addresses, um, do public-private key authentication, and you can do currency conversion between Bitcoin and over 150 different uh, fiat currencies in what I would say is probably the simplest to use platform, especially for mobile, uh, iOS and Android. One cool thing about the platform is because we secure arbitrary data, the transactions that you create inside of the platform, you can actually tag with metadata. You can say, this, this was money that I sent for rent. This was money that I received for a foot massage, whatnot. And that gets automatically encrypted and backed up and synchronized, just like everything else. It's just as secure as your private keys. And looking at what it looks like to send Bitcoin or request Bitcoin, this is about you know, a few lines of code to create a wallet and you specify what's the fiat currency, USD, in that wallet. One line to create a request, so if I wanted to requ request money. Uh, these are optional lines where you can tag that request with information such as the payee and notes. And then after you've done that, you just go ahead and pull out your, your new Bitcoin address. And the Bitcoin address changes with every request. So grab the address, we even support the native image format for mobile, and so you don't have to create the image of the QR code. It all does it for you. And it's just as easy to send Bitcoin as well from that wallet object that you created. Create a spend object, add a Bitcoin address that you want to send money to, and an amount, and then call this routine, sign, broadcast, and save, and off the Bitcoin goes. Just like that, so about three lines of code to send Bitcoin. Pretty simple. You don't deal with any of the, the complex networking all of this accesses the decentralized network of Bitcoin. Highly fault tolerant. So what other cool things can you do with public private key security or edge security? Once you've solved the problem of securing data that only the user can, can access, one of the exciting things that you can do is public private key authentication, which allows us to authenticate with websites without using a password. Instead, we can use public and private keys. And if any of you are developers, you may have already used you know, SSH, has anyone ever used SSH? A handful of people, so it's a way of authenticating with a server. And you can have a private key on your computer and a public key that's on the server, and without entering any password, you automatically get authenticated. We could do this for websites as well. The user experience is great. It's, it's as simple as logging in by tapping a button or scanning a barcode. The reason why we haven't really had it for the past decade is that we haven't been able to secure private keys for the end user. With tools like Airbits and other Bitcoin wallets, you can. And this is an open standard. This is an open protocol that other wallets can use. And there's similar ones as well. And I think in time, some of the competing protocols will converge to a good standard. But the important thing is securing the private key. So other things that can be developed with edge security that we're excited about, and if anyone else is in some of these industries, such as healthcare, being able to secure healthcare records, um, personal information, contacts, address books, and whatnot. Financial applications, we think this is an important one. Financial information has traditionally been considered very sensitive. Um, inside our, our mobile app, we have a mobile app as well. Inside the app is an almost mini Quicken QuickBooks interface where people can add information about their transactions. Well, we apply edge security to that, but heck, the actual Quicken and QuickBooks applications or competitors to them should be doing the same thing. And so the platform does enable that if should they choose to use it. And also IoT, so communication with IoT devices. Um, a lot of IoT devices use centralized servers for you to change the settings of the device. Like 
We have a Nest over here as our thermostat. Bought one to kind of play with and see how it works. And it uses a centralized server that hosts communication from my phone running an app to talk to that device. And you compromise that centralized server, well, guess what? You potentially control the thermostat of, I don't know how many Nest thermostats they've sold, but hundreds of thousands maybe? Um, so an edge secure model can definitely protect against that attack. So cool ways we can be using edge security. Um, so some future functionality that we're targeting for other releases, being able to support JavaScript and Windows. We don't have native support for that platform and language yet at this point. Um, individual repo sharing. This actually lets someone with an account, or once you create an account for a user, create a repository of encrypted data that you can then share with another account. We think that's a very valuable use case. It's, it's not enabled yet, but the, our architecture supports it. It's just not enabled. Um, things like light, native Lightning Network support for, uh, for Bitcoin specifically, not really edge security. And then, of course, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging. You know, once we have secure, sec secure private keys, we can enable uh, communication between the different accounts. And all of that will be supported on the SDK that other apps could use. And so that's the SDK. Now, what have we actually built on top of the SDK? You gotta have an app that actually uses it. Well, we're the first app on our own SDK, which is our Bitcoin wallet. It's open source, it's, it's a template that other developers can use to build their own applications if they'd like. Um, it uses edge security in a few different ways. Number one, the obvious, it secures Bitcoin private keys. Number two, it secures the transaction metadata. You know, who did you pay, where did you go, um, the date of the payments, all of that. It also secures authentication <coughs> credentials Inside of the app, you can actually buy and sell Bitcoin, but it connects to third-party exchanges. But the credentials to those exchanges, it actually uses public-private key authentication. It's securing those same keys that allow you to authenticate with an exchange without having another password. And it secures gift cards, stored value. And so inside the app, you can buy and sell Bitcoin, like I mentioned, and actually also buy gift cards and at a discount because it leverages Bitcoin and the frictionless transfer of value that Bitcoin enables. And that's through one of our, our partners, Fold. So. Go ahead and get your, your coffee or your Target on at a discount. Um, fortunately, the cards are a little slim right now, but they should be slowly trickling back in stock over the course of this week. And effectively, that's it. The platform is available on iOS, Android, Mac, and Linux. Uh, supports all, all the native languages. Um, and like I said, it, it can secure and transact Bitcoin, but we're excited to see what other people could build on the platform that might not even be blockchain related at all. Cool, thanks a lot, that's the presentation. Happy to take any questions. So, question for you in regards to... So is this essentially a merchant processing platform for Bitcoin? Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Is this essentially a merchant processing platform for Bitcoin? I wouldn't call it a merchant processing platform. It, because with Bitcoin, there's not really a big difference between merchant processing and just sending and receiving money. So in the platform, you can send money. In the platform, you can receive money. If you use it for a merchant, then great. And actually, we have an application that's developed using our SDK that is effectively a mini small mobile app merchant point of sale system. But it's not necessarily a merchant processing because with Bitcoin, unless you're converting to fiat currency to dollars, then there's not really anything to process. You're just receiving money or sending money. But you can definitely use it as a merchant tool. That can be done. And it already is being done today. There's actually a few merchants in San Diego that accept Bitcoin. A handful of them actually use Airbits to accept Bitcoin. Well, one more quick question. So how do you guys make your money? So the SDK is a, license, a, a licensed open source model. So we are targeting, and depending on the, the business model of the licensees, but the, the no questions asked, here's what we would charge if you just wanted to use it is approximately a dollar per active account per month um, with the first month free for any new accounts that, that sign in. And just maybe, because some apps would have an account that just gets created and then drops off and never uses it again, so we wouldn't charge for those. So you have that slide with uh, the health data and other forms of data that you could use uh, your bits for encrypting the ad. Just hold the mic up to your mouth while you're talking. Uh, you, you had a, that slide that had healthcare data and a bunch of other applications uh, for Airbit's potential. How far along are you guys in developing those kind of things? Or are, are those just on the radar right now? So we're not the ones developing those. So our, our focus is gonna be securing the data and it's other companies that we'd like to enable to leverage those types of applications. 
So we are in talks with a few companies that are completely non-blockchain related, non-Bitcoin related that are excited to use our platform. And they said, oh my God, Paul, we need exactly this for what we're building. Um, but we're not going to be, we're not the ones building it. And uh, do you have any contracts yet in that direction? Or are you still trying to build those kind of connections? Uh, we're still trying to build. This SDK came out maybe a month and a half ago. So this is, it's very, very early. So we have active ongoing discussions. We do have an agreement with a, a consulting company to build out an identity solution using blockchain and private, public private key authentication, um, which is loosely blockchain Bitcoin related, but not exactly. Um, but the pure apps that have just edge security and not blockchain related at all, there's no contracts yet. But we're excited to see some. The SDK is open source? It's transparent source, I guess some people would call it. So it's open, it's on GitHub, you can take a look at it. Um, but to use it requires an API key. Okay. And there's a no modify license on it right now. And the, char the charge that you have is for the SDK or for the app? It's for the SDK. Yeah. Uh <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, the question I have is related to edge security. So uh, security in edge devices is usually protected through hardware secrets uh, that are embedded in the device uh, if you want to do it properly. Um, so you've talked about providing private keys uh, on an edge, on a client device, um, and they're protected through the system somehow, but I still don't understand how even if the private keys are somehow managed in the network uh, of the blockchain, some ID or something must be coming from the device to allow access to the uh, private key. So how, how does that work and how is that secured? Okay, so the private key, if you're talking about private keys for Bitcoin or for authentication, is that what you're referring to as, as private keys? Yeah, the, the private keys you um, had listed in some of the slides where you're protecting your transactions through a private key embedded on the device. Um, where, where, what is that? Where does it come from? How is that protected? Uh, or its ID, how is that protected on the device? Got it, so we treat our private key the same way as we treat all other data that we wanna protect. And with the sake of Bitcoin, the private key is nothing more than a random number that gets generated on the device. It's then encrypted with a hash, it's actually encrypted with a completely random number so it's a cryptographically secure random number. And then it's further encrypted with that random number is then encrypted with a strong hash of the user's username and password. That data then is then backed up onto our servers. Does that answer the question as far as you know, the levels of security and the encryption? Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it does answer the specifics, but it doesn't address uh, where the security is uh, coming from because the various uh, security mechanisms we talked about can, I think, I haven't thought this through, but it seems like there are uh, attacks on that. There's attacks on every single model you can possibly think about. The, the thing that you need to try to build in general that people should be focusing on is not to build it 100% because the, the, the closer you get to 100%, almost certainly, the harder it will be for an end user to use. And odds are they're just simply not gonna use it or they will be their own attack vector. Like they will be the one that loses their data. So no, no, yes, no, there's no. an attack vector. Yes, there's an attack vector on every single device. The goal is to make the server not the attack vector and also to make the device as much as possible not. So the, the way we're implementing the security is the data before it even touches the device is already encrypted. And the key that encrypts the data is only known to the user. It's only in their head. That's the key to it. I sure understand, but the uh, modern devices, including certainly phones, PCs, uh, laptops, they're all embedded these days with TPMs that are secure hardware devices that can be utilized for this purpose. Correct, and they're great storage mechanisms for a decryption key. So for example, Apple and the iPhone, has, they have a secure element which can store data and it's nearly unbreakable. What that allows us to do, and we support natively in the SDK actually, we support Touch ID is to, to put a decryption, decryption key inside of the secure element, which a user can retrieve back using a thumbprint. However, TPMs cannot back up uh, encrypted data. So that's where we, our software has to come in and our server network has to come in. 
And the key thing is that before it even touches the network, it's encrypted with a key that only the user has access to. If you try to encrypt data using a key that only the hardware has access to, then if you lose that device, you lose the key that can decrypt the data. And so that's inherently one of the biggest challenges with hardware element security is that it might be super secure, but now the user becomes the threat because if they lose their device, they lose the access to their data. Okay, yeah, so now, now I understand. So, so you do utilize hardware security if it's available on a device, um, but otherwise you've got mechanisms to protect uh, the user from tripping over themselves. We use hardware security if it, uh, right now only on iPhone. We don't utilize it on Android because the devices are so sc kind of scattered as far as what they support. But on, on iOS, we use hardware security to secure a key that can decrypt, mostly re really for convenience because that allows someone to do a touch ID type of authentication and then unlock the key that can decrypt their data. But at the same time, there is a backup mechanism because the, key, uh, the main key that can decrypt their data is in their head and that can be recovered on another device. All right, great, thanks. Good question. My question is along the same lines you are just talking about. If you lose your device and you, all you have is your password, how do you recover your data and how is that data protected? How do you not have access to it? So we use hashes of usernames and passwords to encrypt the data. So the key thing is that you can hash a password in multiple different ways and you can salt it and hash it in such a way that two different hashes are created that can't be derived from each other. So it's kind of a long-winded way of saying, I can take a username and password, scramble it into a key that can encrypt data. That's what we use when a user punches in a username and password to decrypt data. And then I can take the same username and password, scramble it with a hash, and use that other key to, to authenticate with our servers. So that hash that authenticates with our servers is a way to authenticate to then download your encrypted data. But the other hash, which happens locally on your device, is what you use to decrypt your data. So even though we have a hash of a username and password, that hash cannot decrypt your data. And we can't create the original username and password from that hash. That's the key thing. So a lot of, a lot of apps will make this a two-step process where, okay, give us a password that we use for authentication to a server to get your encrypted data, and then give us another username and password to actually encrypt your data. And we just simply put it all into one and do two, do two different hashes. That way the user is given a familiar authentication experience to logging into a website, but at the same time, it's actually implementing encryption and synchronization in the back end. Whereas they still don't have to trust us because we don't have the ability to create that decrypting hash. I'm afraid the failure is my own on this, but how do you, so you had your data encrypted with the key that stayed on your device, but then I lost that device. How do you retrieve that key that was only on my device that you don't know? And I understand that like you're, you do it from a hash from the password and username, um, but I'm not exactly sure why you couldn't recreate that hash knowing my password and username. I guess you wouldn't know my password. Yes, we don't know an original, we don't know a full password. So Airbus does not see an actual clear text password ever. Right. The software on the phone sees it, but as a company, it never goes over the network. We even assume that the network is compromised. So even a compromised network would not see the, the regular password. And I think you'd asked, how do we recreate that, that random key that encrypts the data? Well, we actually encrypt that random key and then we back up the random key as well. Once it's encrypted, we back up that random key. Thanks. Okay. So the, um, the server component, would a company adapting the software use your servers or could they uh, deploy their own servers? And... So the question is, would a company adopting our software use our servers or deploy their own? So we would very, very much prefer that they utilize at least our authentication servers because that's where all the hash usernames and passwords go and that allows us to have more of kind of the single sign-on OAuth model where the same credentials could be used across different applications. Um, we actually have, I've got one more slide in here, we have this kind of interesting server model where this is where hashed usernames and passwords live, but the actual encrypted data sits on this peer-to-peer -peer network of, of servers, even though we do control them. Uh, I, will, I wouldn't have an, an issue with a company hosting their own, you know, kind of one of these sync servers, um, but for authentication purposes, it's really nice having one, one solid pool of authentication credentials. 
Uh, we are in talks with some companies that just want to buy out completely the entire technology, license everything, and host their own. And so everyone has a price. How many bits is your identity key? What is an identity key? Because I never said the your word identity key. key. The private key, uh, whatever a standard elliptic curve Bitcoin private key is, because it's just Bitcoin, so whatever Bitcoin uses. I believe it's 192, but don't quote me on that. All right, well, if there's no other questions, thanks a lot, folks. And once again, I'm going to reiterate what Will said.